live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering Red Hat Summit 2019. Brought to you by Red Hat. Welcome back live here in Boston, along with Stu Miniman. I'm John Walls. You are watching theCUBE. We're at the Red Hat Summit for the sixth time in our CUBE history. Glad to be here. A beautiful, gorgeous day, Stu, by the way, in your hometown. Yeah, Love it. Be beautiful that it was a little cold when we were here two years ago, but a uh, lovely spring day yeah, great, in great Boston. To, great to be here. Glad you're with us here on theCUBE. Glad to have John Healy with us as well. He is the uh, VP of the Internet of Things Group at Intel, as long as the GM of Platform Management and Customer Engineering. John, good morning to you. Good morning to you, too. All right, Glad you're, to be here. You're, you're kind of the, the newbie on the block there in the IoT group. Um, you're data center for a long time, yeah. uh, moving over to IoT. So just, if you would tell me a little bit about that transition, yeah, it's uh, really what you're seeing, and, and kind of what's exciting you about this opportunity for you. So it's really interesting. I mean, I spent nearly 15 years uh, with the data center group in Intel, and did a ton of work with partners like Red Hat over the years. A lot of our focus was in how we bring a lot of data center technologies and grow them somewhat beyond the, the basic data center. I spent a lot of time on the network side, working with comm service providers on NFV and the build out of their, their, the softwareization or cloudification, if you like, of the infrastructure. And now moving over to IoT, it's almost like I'm going to the other end of the wire. You know, all of the applications and the services we were focused on were very much IoT centric you know, enabling new markets, enabling customers to do things when they connected their different devices in ways they couldn't have done before. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the focus now is on how we continue to bring those cloud technologies, a lot of things that have matured in the data center, further and further down in a lot of cases to the edge, a lot of people yeah. talk about the cloudification of mm -hmm. the edge, and enable new IoT services and new IoT applications to be, to be, to be fulfilled and to be delivered. Yeah. John, John, you bring great context to this discussion. As I said, the last 10 years, there was that pull of the cloud, and and Intel is at every single show that, that we go to. Um, and a lot of people haven't fully understand and grasp. They hear edge computing, they hear IoT, and they're, it's big, you know, orders of magnitudes, more devices, the, you know, uh, the, the surface area that we're going to do there. But a lot of times they're like, oh, well, we're bringing it out of the cloud and back there, and we're back in the data center. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is not the data centers that you built before. But there is connection between the data centers sure. and the cloud, and the cloud and the edge, and the edge in there. So you've got good content. Help, help frame it a little bit as to where we are in their discussion, so some of the users, where they they are in the whole IoT discussion. Yeah, and I think if we even take a step back from, from looking at one, one demograph versus another, I think yeah. of IoT versus cloud, it really is the, the continued proliferation of distributed computing. Think of that as sort of the, the horizontal underpinning or foundation of all Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. It's how do I enable more and more advanced intelligence and insight to be gained from the data that's being created and derived in how I run my infrastructure and relay new services and new capabilities on top of it. And then you start applying that to all of the different markets and there's almost no market that you could conceive that can't take advantage of that. So as we built out data center capability and all of the underpinnings and how you best build out those platforms and take advantage of all of the innovation, work with you know, partners like Red Hat has been a critical component of that. So you know, we've worked with them for Almost, actually since the beginning, we were one of the early investors. And, and work with, the, with, with a partner like Red Hat to make sure that those infrastructure componentries are optimized to work well together. Build the reference architectures that can be deployable in a data center environment, whether it's in an enterprise or in a cloud, cloud vendor's environment, and increasingly enable them to build open and hybrid implementations. Now the reason I start there is because really we're proliferating from that base. So if you consider, and we do, that the future is open, hybrid implementations, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, where the workload can be enabled and supported by the best implementation and best environment from it. It could be the best cloud environment, the best underpinning platforms, and the best solution stacks to enable that to occur. We're now moving that into the realm of, of more and more of the IoT applications, whether it's in industrial environments, it's in healthcare environments, in retail, and automotive, all of across the different landscape, this, the premise is essentially the same, that we ensure that the right environment is created for the application to be supported, and we're bringing more and more of the environmental you know, capabilities of cloud-like deployment, cloud-like management, increasingly out into those applications. So if we look at each of the different markets, there are differing points of, of their maturity or of their development. I like to use the example of the comm service providers, or telecom service providers, as a sort of a, a basis of, well, this is what happened 
when an, a, an entire market looked at the benefits of data center technology or server technologies and wanted the economies of scale and the openness of those environments to be appropriate and deployed in their environment, in their networks. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that over the last 10 years in the journey from software-defined networking all the way through to NFV and now what's happening with cloudification of the network. Industrial environments are very, very similar. Decades of building you know, vertically integrated solutions, but now looking for the economies of scale that cloud-like technology and open interfaces and open abstractions can provide. And we're starting to see them embark on that journey in a very similar manner. So I see parallels as we move from one market to the other, but the basic underpinning is, is very similar, how we take advantage of those, of those capabilities. Yeah, fascinating stuff. As you, you said, it's distributed architectures is where we're building. Um, I look at Intel, and it's fascinating to me because on the one hand, everything's becoming more and more distributed, yet at the same time, you're baking things down into the chip as much as you can, you're working with partners at Red Hat to make sure that you know, it gets baked into the kernel, so you, you've got that give and take that it's both being as distributed as possible, yet every component gets things like security built into them, and right. it has to work with all of the environment, so it's not the discrete components that we might have had in the before. You talk about like, you know, IT versus OT, well they're becoming very similar. Telecommunications is not the telecom of the dot-com boom, uh, they're doing things like NFV and the like, so, um, you know, we're, we're starting to see IT kind of take over a lot of those environments, are That's we right. not? Well, yeah. I, I think IT constructs and, and, yes. the, and the abilities and capabilities of IT. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's the merging, it really is, and we saw this, you know, we've seen it over the last number of years, it really is a marriage of both environments coming together. The, the, the mechanisms but through which IT will deploy and manage the infrastructure, married to the, the, the expectations from a SLA and quality of service and such that's required on the network, just as one example. And then as we work with, with a partner like Red Hat, you know, what's critically important is that we have multi-party approaches to the market, which I think, Stu, to your point, is kind of another dynamic we're seeing, is that the implementation of the final solution at a platform level requires collaboration across multiple different entities, multiple different partners. Mm -hmm. So if we're working with Cisco or with Dell or with Lenovo and Red Hat, we're bringing together reference architectures that take advantage of the innovations in the platform, the work we're doing, the innovations into the silicon, and the enabling and preservation of those innovations through the software stack. So whether it's RHEL or it's REV or it's OSP, and make sure that those are exposed and can be preserved in the implementation. So then the application that sits on top of the stack can take advantage all the way down and be provisioned such that it maintains the policies and the, the levels of performance and such that have been defined for it. I'd like to you know, go back to the telecom um, illustration that you were talking about just a moment ago. Um, and we talked about the internet of things and this explosion of devices and capabilities and, and the new spectrum that's being rolled out, right? Yeah. 5G mm -hmm. on the horizon, you know, very much in a, a nascent stage right now. What is that going to do in terms of, of your attention or your focus because of the capabilities that are going to be provided, you know, that I can't even imagine, you know, with the kinds of speeds we're talking about, the capabilities right. we're talking about. Well, how does that change your world? The, I think what is fundamental about 5G is the, how it starts to address some of the underpinning challenges in deploying multiple billions of connected end state, endpoints or devices. So IoT you know, subscribes really to two things, connectivity and then the access to or unleashing of all of the data. It's really those two dynamics. Once you connect these devices together or provide for connectivity to and from them, you now have the ability to derive more insight from the data that they're capturing mm -hmm. and to make more intelligent and informed decisions about how you provision. And then all sorts of new applications and, and service types become possible as a result of that. But there in, in both of those, there's a challenge. How do you connect all of those devices together in a manner that's you know, efficient to deploy and easy to manage and also provides for the connectivity that is very bursty in nature? You know, there are times when you'll need pretty reasonably sizable bandwidth if it's a video type application, and times when you really won't need very much at all. And how do you do that in an environment that's affordable and cost effective to deploy? Mm -hmm. If you're a, a, a manufacturing plant uh, manager, running cable to every single one of your, your uh, you know, nodes or connectors or um, um, sensors across your, across your production plant is a pretty onerous task and it's an expensive uh, capital deployment. But 5G provides you the ability to provide that connectivity in, within your enterprise or within your, your factory environment in an efficient manner. It's wireless based. Mm -hmm. But it also provides for the very low latency that allows for real-time applications and it provides for mass deployment and management of very large numbers of endpoints. 
So if we think of the, the density of 5G, the low latency capability of it, and then the manageability in a, in a framework that is, or in an environment that is predictable, that is policy and SLA governed, mm -hmm. you start to address some of the really fundamental challenges that connecting vast numbers of devices can be, can be uh, that, that it can present. So I see 5G as a path to significantly accelerating what we have always envisioned as being the internet of things. Hmm. And as a result of it, new services and new, new uh, service categories will be enabled on top of it that heretofore were maybe possible but not possible in an efficient and affordable I mean, manner. Can you give me, give me a practical example of that or, or just? Well, if you think even a smart city as an example, where the light posts and the traffic signals and kiosks are all playing a role in a connected mesh of, of, of interconnected entities, you could have a situation, and you know, for the US audience, something like an Amber Alert, which we'd see mm -hmm. where we're, we want to you know, search for a very specific license plate in the city. Well, today it's a pretty manual process. The, the Amber mm -hmm. Alert is issued, it may be a text on your phone, so mm -hmm. we, get, we get those alerts. There's oftentimes a display over the smart, to the smart display over the freeway. But then it's up to the drivers to look out. We'll just consider the possibilities when the cars, using their own vision, which the autonomous driving you know, evolution or revolution is allowing us to, to, is progressing, all of the cameras on all of the cars now become actively watching for license plates. And they can pick out whether, and then a car can enroll itself into or out of that service. Hmm. So if your car is sitting in a garage and this request comes, it'll, it'll, it will report back, I'm sitting in the garage, I'm not part of the mix. Hmm. But if it's on the freeway, it can enroll itself and start to actively search for, for that license plate. Mm -hmm. That's an example. Mm -hmm. And then all of the connected nodes across the city become points for exchange of data to and from the different cars as mm -hmm. they're passing by. And all of that infrastructure is enabled by 5G. So that's an application that yeah, we don't have it today, but it becomes a very possible a application sure. in the future. All right, so John, we're, we're here at Red Hat Summit, and as you said, Intel and Red Hat have a long partnership. Uh, RHEL 8 was announced today. Give us the latest on the deep integrations uh, and uh, what, what users should be expecting. Yeah, and what we're really excited about with, 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 with Red Hat, over the years, uh, we've really shared a common vision about what we believe the industry should be, should be capable of, of, of achieving. And this concept of open hybrid environments, open hybrid clouds, we've been working with them for, for a long time on how we best enable that. So in upstream, we work well together, we collaborate on what technologies we want to see exposed and uh, supported within the different communities. And then on the downstream into the products, with an example of what you're describing, Stu, with RHEL 8, what's really exciting is we did a, just as an example, we did a very large data-centric launch in early April. We were extremely excited to bring a, you know, a whole uh, uh, portfolio of new products to market together, which spanned from new CPUs all the way through to some of our storage products and, uh, and, and memory products. And the, the capabilities of each of those is what really needs to be, to continue to be integrated and supported within the, the product portfolio that Red Hat have. So with RHEL 8, we're seeing things like our DL Boost for deep learning, you know, taking advantage of specific accelerations within the CPU in our, in our uh, scalable Xeon processor so that it can take advantage of those and really enhance the performance and behaviors of the deep learning algorithms, uh, just as one example. And that's you know, time to market with us on, on, on RHEL 8. We're delighted that that integration has happened. Same thing with some of our, our, uh, our, our memory technologies and the support for those within, the, within, within RHEL. So a customer deploying an application knows that the, the innovations within the hardware, within the silicon, are available and manageable uh, from the software environment that they're deploying. And that's the, that's the benefit of this tight collaboration as we plan together for future you know, uh, innovations and how they can best be integrated and do the work upstream in advance of that so that the community issues, whether it's OpenShift or OpenStack, is, is, is enabled and capable of supporting them at the same time. Mm -hmm. Internet of Things, just before you head off. Where do you want to, I mean, you, you're still relatively fresh, right, to that, to that space. Where do you want to, where do you think you want it to go with Intel? Like, where, what's your vision or what are your thoughts about the kinds of areas that you'd like to explore here over the next 18, 24 months? I think we have, uh, firstly, it's an incredibly exciting market. Uh, some of the examples we just spoke about, with the possibilities that they open up for our, for, for our, in, for our customers, but also for our partners to really evoke new forms of business, new revenues, new capabilities as a result of bringing the, the marriage of 
of cloud technology together with the economics of you know, volume uh, uh, technology consumption and deployment and all of those assets across into a, a new set of, of, of applications that IoT opens up. I see tremendous opportunity to, to, to make that marriage happen. But also because I've spent so much time on the infrastructure side and very much with comm service providers, you know, I can feel the, the pent up desire to find ways to deploy new types of managed services and new monetization models if they can get insight to the data, how we, how we do uh, you know, optimal deployment of networks, manage infrastructure on behalf of end customers, and all that becomes possible if we bring the application end in the IoT closer to the infrastructure. So a lot of my focus will be on really bridging across those, those different worlds and ensuring that with work with, the like, with you know, partners like Red Hat continue to be, to be developed very successfully. And we open up new opportunities for each other. Sure. It's an exciting time, there's no doubt about that. It You're is. at this great convergence, right? You're at the, the fun and games part of this. That's right. you know, with devices and that exponential growth. John, thanks for the time. Sure, thank you. We appreciate it. Glad to have you here once on theCUBE, uh, once again. John Healy joining us from Intel, back with more live from Boston. You're watching theCUBE.